fine, you're fine. You always use a condom, so you're fine. Hey, dude. <laughs> I've got this thing. If a young woman needs a procedure, is that possible? Where's the closest facility? There's an Albuquerque in Missouri? The law won't let me get one without my parents knowing. I know we're not close anymore. True. And I'm the last person that you want to help. Accurate. But I need your help, and I don't have anywhere else to go. Go where? To get the thing, the, the procedure. So you're hiding this from your man, your best friend. Hey, girl. And your Jesus freak parents. And you thought, why not ask Bailey Butler to drive me hundreds of miles? Because she probably doesn't have anything to do anyway. Kind of, yes. Bailey, Bailey, come on. I'm just messing with you. You're right, I do not have anything going on. I thought you drove a Camry. I don't think that this is what you really want. It's my life, it's my choice. Killing a baby, but it's a road trip adventure because girl power? Whoa! John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off, Kami. It's been a while since we talked about abortion, so this will be a good one. I've actually, I've been called radically pro-life before, which just means that it's very difficult to present me with circumstances which I would believe justify the killing of innocent life, but the trailer for this movie actually came out a few days ago, and when I first saw it, I was very surprised, but at the same time, I was not surprised at all, because, you know, you, you watch it, and you think, wow, I can't believe that they would present a, a teenage mother getting an abortion without telling her parents as just a fun road trip comedy that's disgusting, that's depraved, but then you look outside, and you remember that we're going to hell in a handcart, so in a way, it makes perfect sense. But speaking of things that make perfect sense, why do you think that the left champions abortion so much? Why do you think that they celebrate it so much? Why are there parades for it? Why do they dedicate ceremonies and clothing to it? Why do they evangelically praise it and remind you of the abortions that they've had, trying to convince you and perhaps even themselves that it was okay and that it was the right thing to do? Well, the reason is that abortion is the crown jewel of their religion. It is the ultimate state of liberal philosophy. It is the logical conclusion of liberal philosophy. It means that they are so liberated and so autonomous that they can literally murder another human being if its life is inconvenient to them. It means that they get to play God. And perhaps you don't believe that abortion is murder, so we'll get to that a little bit later, but if you think about what differentiates the left from the right, uh, it can most simply be articulated as the belief in hierarchy versus the belief in total equality. And a lot of people have this take of, well, the left and right paradigm is false. It's not real. Both sides are the same. Kind of cringe, also just not true. Like, politicians lying doesn't invalidate the historical and philosophical nature of the right and the left. And that categorization dates back to the aftermath of the French Revolution, where those who believed in total equality sat on the left and those who believed in hierarchy sat on the right. And so liberalism's belief in total equality, the idea that we're all born the same, has led to the belief that man ought to be liberated even from the constraints and unfairness of nature. That nature, which produces hierarchy, also known as inequality, as well as human life. So to be truly liberated means to even be liberated from nature, which means that the state must enforce equality, since if left alone, inequality will result, and also to be liberated from the natural consequence of sex, which is pregnancy. And so, as we can see, the results of this have been things like abortion and state-enforced equality of outcome. So it's all connected, and that's why abortion is so important to them. The most fundamental characteristic of a human being and of nature in general, the ability to reproduce, has been conquered by liberalism through abstract rationalizations. There will never be a greater accomplishment for liberalism since nothing takes precedence over the value of human life unless they can manage to like scientifically clone people or to actualize asexual reproduction, but only then will something even begin to rival the magnitude of abortion as the quintessential accomplishment of liberalism, the complete disregard of the other over whom one has a host of moral and perhaps even biological obligations in pursuit of the divine self. It's abhorrent. But anyways, we'll watch the trailer, we'll go over that, and then we'll talk about why this movie is so terrible and harmful, and also why abortion in general is so terrible and harmful, along with what all of this means for our country. But before we get into that, I do have to tell you very quickly about a service I've been using for the last few months called ExpressVPN. For those of you unfamiliar, a VPN is a virtual private network, and it protects you from government agencies trying to monitor you, from companies trying to sell your data for their profit, and also from hackers who might try to steal your personal and private information, anything from credit cards and banking information to your private correspondences with Brittany Venti, you wouldn't want that. So you can go to expressvpn.com slash Doyle to find out how you get three months absolutely free. There is a link in the description that is expressvpn.com slash Doyle. I spend a lot of time 
doing research in coffee shops or in libraries. And if I weren't using a VPN, the people connected to the same Wi-Fi network as me could literally steal all my information with just a rudimentary knowledge of computers. But with ExpressVPN, you're completely protected. And this, this can even happen to you in the privacy of your own home. So if you don't want people getting access to your information and browsing habits, you're definitely gonna wanna look into this. And even if you're not worried about that, you can use it for a bunch of other stuff, like accessing content that isn't available in your country by literally just culturally appropriating another identity with the push of a button. And then the internet thinks that you live somewhere else that allows you to access previously restricted content. It's pretty epic. It's a top rated VPN provider in the game. They've got the fastest speeds along with 24 seven customer support. So if for some reason it won't let you masquerade as Vietnamese or Indian, they'll help you right away with that. You'll be good to go. Plus they don't keep any of your information for themselves. It's literally impossible given the way that their servers are designed. So go check them out at expressvpn.com slash Doyle. They're a good friend of the channel. It's a great service. That is expressvpn.com slash Doyle. Click the link in the description to find out how to get three months totally free. But anyways, let's go through the trailer. Fine, you're fine. You always use a condom, so you're fine. Hey, dude. <laughs> you, I've got this thing. If a young woman needs a procedure, is that possible? Where's the closest facility? There's an Albuquerque in Missouri? The law won't let me get one without my parents knowing. Some important context for this movie, by the way, is that the reason she needs to get this abortion, the reason that she needs to kill this child is because according to the descriptions of the film, having this child would squander her Ivy League college dreams. And this is not unlike when we saw Michelle Williams praise abortion at the Golden Globes and say that if it weren't for her abortion, she never would have been able to receive that award. Perhaps this is operating on a different scale, but the premise remains the same, which is that the life of a human being is second to my desires, that not only is it permissible, but it's actually good to sacrifice human life at the altar of fame, fortune, or status. It's evil. More specifically, it's satanic, but I'm sure we'll get into that later. I'd be surprised if, if we could avoid it. Might have to go preacher mode. We'll see. But this whole leftist narrative of, oh, well, motherhood? Serving your family? That's not empowering for women. You know what is empowering for women? Serving an employer. Not getting married and having kids, but working 50 hours a week, entering numbers into a spreadsheet, or writing legal briefs. That's what it really means to be a woman. And as it would turn out, as we've experienced a few decades of that supposed female empowerment, women are experiencing record levels of depression. They are more depressed than men, they're becoming more depressed relative to men, and they're more depressed than their mothers and their grandmothers at the same stages of their lives. This is referred to as the paradox of declining female happiness. And so for Hollywood to come in and communicate to young girls, hey, it's totally normal for you to be sexually active in high school, <laughs> saving yourself for marriage, that's outdated. People back then weren't as smart as we are now. I mean, you know, they still thought that only women could give birth, but we're smarter now. And also, if you happen to get pregnant doing that thing that is designed to get you pregnant, just kill the kid. You gotta go be a number at a university. And then you gotta go be a number at some company. Don't settle down, don't have a family. That's not what you want. You wanna do what the men do because the best way to empower women is to rape them of their feminine identity and then tell them that femininity is oppressive and they have to strive to be just like men. And the only people who actually get to proudly embody womanhood are delusional men. That's what our daughters are learning. Our daughters are taught that the defining characteristic of their identity as a woman is not their ability to create life, but rather their choice, their rights to kill that life if it's inconvenient to them. It's disgusting. Let's empower women by rejecting the fundamental characteristics of womanhood. That's why the pioneering feminists didn't want women to even have a choice. Simone de Beauvoir told Betty Friedan that if women were allowed to make the choice for themselves, then too many would want to stay home and raise children. And so the only way for them to achieve the goals of their narrative was to indoctrinate generations of women into this completely artificial perversion of what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a mother. I mean, the movie is literally called Unpregnant. What does that even mean? That's not a real concept. That's a euphemism. Typically, you'd expect that to mean like, oh, she gave birth to the child. But no, in this case, it would mean that she killed it. And they're not even taking the extreme approach, right? Like they're not even taking the, oh, well, you know, the mother's health was, no, they're just saying, well, you know, she wants to go to college, so she should be able to kill it. And these types of reasons make up the vast, vast, vast majority of reasons for women getting abortions, by the way, which is why you can never compromise with these people on anything because they will never stop. And I also like how this is where we're at now with teenage movies. Like this is what the coming of age stories are now. And they're only gonna get worse from here. And you can trace the evolution like, dude, let's throw a party while mom and dad are gone. Dude, let's drink beer. We don't have to tell our parents. Hey, let's sneak out Saturday night so we can go make out in a car with bench seating. And now it's like, hey, I'm pregnant. And I wanna kill the child. Let's go on a road trip. I also like when she's waiting for the test results, she's telling herself like, oh, I can't be pregnant because I always use a condom, which is really just sad because you've got this girl 
He was sexually active in high school, and through habitual participation of the act designed to create human life, she manages to create a human life. And because she was irresponsible, because she wasn't ready to be a mother yet, now that life, which she is responsible for creating, has to die. But it's okay, because she's going to go get a degree, probably in something useless. And, uh, you know, she got to secrete some dopamine and oxytocin along the way. Was it worth it, Mommy? I know we're not close anymore. True. And I'm the last person that you want to help. Accurate. But I need your help and I don't have anywhere else to go. Go where? To get the thing, the, the procedure. So you're hiding this from your man, your best friend. Hey girl. And your Jesus freak parents. And you thought, why not ask Bailey Butler to drive me hundreds of miles? Because she probably doesn't have anything to do anyway. Kind of, yes. Bailey, Bailey, come on. I'm just messing with you. You're right, I do not have anything going on. I thought you drove a Camry. Ah! Road trip! Road trip! Abortion is much less of a traumatic event, much more of a road trip. Teen pregnancy is quirky. Killing babies is quirky. This is definitely not a cope. It's not like when people celebrate their abortions, they have to assure us that they don't regret it, that it was the best decision that they ever made. Yeah, yeah, okay. Which one of us are you trying to convince, me or you? Celebrating abortion is a cope. Women are much more likely to develop anxiety disorders, depression, uh, substance abuse problems, or to commit suicide after they've had an abortion. And the left's answer to this is because everything ever has been socially constructed. It's because people like you make them feel bad about it, which again is a cope. And I also like how this is the problem in the film. The central conflict is not that the girl is pregnant. It's not that she's inheriting this responsibility. The problem is, oh, I'm definitely going to kill it. It's just going to be kind of tricky because I can't let my parents find out about it because, you know, they would stop me. And that's inconvenient to what I want, which, of course, just reinforces the eternal antagonist as the parents and their Christian moral code. Remember, the girl referred to the parents as a Jesus freak parents. Using Jesus freak or anything adjacent as a pejorative uh, is the biggest rhetorical cope in the history of the English language. What does it mean to be a Jesus freak? Like, bro, you're so pious. Ha <laughs> ha! Bro, I bet the only thing you kneel for is Christ and not literally any minority who asks you to. What an idiot. Bro, I bet you keep a pure mind and don't even watch cartoon animals have sex. What a loser. It's such a cope. And I'm not saying all atheists are like that, but the people who are like that, these very disgusting, hedonistic, degenerate people, the people who would use Jesus freak as an insult, they're all atheists. And we can talk about the difference between policies all day long, but really what it comes down to is the original and eternal conflict between good and evil. This is not Republicans versus Democrats or conservatives versus liberals. This is good versus evil. And we'll get more in depth with that in a second, but that's the most important thing to be thinking about when looking at things like this. Because, it, you know, you look outside the state of the country, the state of the world, once you accept that, everything else just makes sense. And of course, I would never go as far as to say something like, the movie is satanic. Uh, however, if Satanists were producing content, you know, this is about exactly what it would look like. You know, not, hey girl, I need your help raising this child or with completing the pregnancy and putting it up for adoption, which would be so easy since there are huge waiting lists for newborn babies at any given time. No, we're actually just gonna go kill it and I'm not gonna tell my parents because I don't need them reminding me that what I'm doing is selfish and wrong. Yes. Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico. We'll be in Albuquerque by tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. No. And we'll be home Sunday evening. I'm setting the alarm for 5 a.m. Self-care, huh? I had to post something so people wouldn't bother me. Of course, and so people wouldn't know you're with me. Have a heart. And we both know you wouldn't do the same for me. You made it really hard to be your friend. I'm sorry that I couldn't be perfect for I you never all the time. I needed you to be perfect. I appreciate everything you've done for me. You crazy idiot! That is so goddamn nice! Let's go! Got him in the bathroom. Now we've got this arc, which is just incredible, and it's that the film is going to emphasize more on the relationship between these two girls than on the relationship between the mother and her child. They're going to make this relationship appear to be more significant and more emotional than the relationship between the mother and her child. And the reason for that is that they don't want to acknowledge a relationship. It doesn't exist. It's not a child. It's not even a life. It's just a clump of cells. The real focus here is on the fact that the one girl hasn't always been so nice to the other girl, but now they're uniting together to kill a kid because girl power. And abortion is actually a very simple issue. Like, it gets overcomplicated because both sides have very vested interests in the outcomes. And so we get into these complex philosophical and bioethical discussions. But then we also get into these less intelligent, you know, no uterus, no opinion type discussions. But when you clear all the smoke away, it just boils down to if that is a human life, then you can't kill it. And the problem with that is that it's fairly easy to prove that what occupies these wombs are human beings and that they are alive. And so that presupposes that human life has value, which is actually not something that the right and left agree upon anymore, which is why from there, the left will get into arguments like, well, 
all, it's not enough to be a human being. It has to have personhood as defined by whichever arbitrary metric is most convenient at the time, be it sentience, viability, etc. Or, well, that doesn't matter because we have bodily autonomy, which means that we can do what we want regardless. My body, my choice. And so again, the conflict is much less right versus left, uh, pro-life versus pro-choice. It really just comes down to whether you believe that human life has unique value. Do you really think these women that march in Washington screaming at the top of their lungs about how it's their right to abort their children if they want to go get a sociology degree, do you really think that the problem there is that they just don't recognize that they're killing innocent human life? No. The problem is that they don't value innocent human life, especially if it interferes with or inconveniences their subjective desires. That's why the old arguments don't really work anymore. I mean, we used to be able to say things like, hey, you know, uh, have you at least considered that if you're wrong, it would mean that you're advocating for the murder of children? Because now, that's not even effective anymore because it is assumes that they'd agree that we're wrong, even if the mainstream narrative didn't support it and it inconveniences their lifestyle. It gets back to whether we even agree that innocent human life has unique value. And again, that's just a conflict between good and evil. Why are they looking at the car? I see my mom's boyfriend's car. And we're driving a stolen car. Hello? If you don't help us out, we're going to be in so much trouble. I don't think that this is what you really want. It's my life. It's my choice. Grab on! Hold tight! Grab on me! One, two, three! Trees go fast. Politics aside, my most accurate take about this film is that it's not going to be funny. And it's going to be for the same reason that it's very difficult for women to be funny in general, because there are approved strains of female comedy. Female comedy is always about rejecting the perceived standards of morality and feminine behavior. It's not created, nor is it viewed to make the intended audience feel good in an amusing way or in a funny way, but rather to energize them through communicating to them that these women are rejecting those oppressive patriarchal standards and they're having fun while doing it. Look, they're on a roller coaster while pregnant? What? These wild and crazy girls aren't supposed to do that. That's why generally speaking, female comedy is always like, I eat lots of food. I'm messy. I have sex with lots of men. I get pregnant and murder the children for sport, etc. And male comedy is generally, you know, actually funny. And of course, there are exceptions to this. But the problem is that because those exceptions don't fit the approved narrative, they don't find as much mainstream success. But it's also interesting how the title cards mentioned that her life got off track and, and now she must forge her own path. And that's actually really deep when you think about it. Like, I wonder if the person who wrote that is pro-life. Maybe they're a fan of the show because what that's saying is like, okay, you were perhaps behaving recklessly. You weren't ready to be a mother, but you were still actively having sex with men who you presumably wouldn't want to father your children. This wasn't supposed to happen, but guess what? It did happen. And now you have a choice to make. You have to forge your destiny. You have to forge your own path. Are you going to take responsibility for your actions or are you going to run from them? Are you going to allow this child to live his or her life or are you going to take that from them because you're a coward and because you're selfish? And this girl even says to the guy who I think is actually the father of the child. Well, it's my life and it's my choice. And we first have to ask her to check her privilege because isn't she fortunate? Isn't she fortunate to have the power in the situation? Do you think she'd feel the same way if she were in the position of the child? There's a great Reagan quote, um, which is, I've noticed that everyone who is pro-choice has already been born. And that's absolutely true. These are people who have been born. Their parents have made sacrifices to give them life and they are unwilling to carry the torch for their own selfish reasons. So no, it's not actually your life and it's not actually your choice because you don't just get to do whatever you want simply by virtue of your being alive and simply by virtue of your ability to do whatever you want hypothetically. Like what an unfortunate reality this is. What an unfortunate time we live in where people construct their livelihoods convincing young women that not only is motherhood unimportant, it's actually undesirable and they make money doing it. And we all become more miserable as a result as our country deteriorates in front of us as the greatest civilization in the history of the world slowly dies as we have failed to carry the torch passed down by our ancestors because we're selfish and because we thought that we could ignore conventional wisdom. We thought that we could elevate evil and remain good. Okay, for the record, none of what I'm about to say is necessarily to make an argument against abortion. I'm more than capable of arguing against abortion in a completely secular framework, as I have done many times on this channel before, but I'm doing it. I'm going big time preacher mode now, so click away if you're not ready for this information yet. And if you stick around, you don't get to complain about, well, he's forcing his beliefs on us. Yeah, that's what I do. But you're okay with it when it's about gun control, or when it's about climate change, but when it's about, I don't know, the truth of our existence, which requires you to be a good person, well, then you don't want to hear it. 
But that's okay. I'm not really speaking to those people anyways. I'm speaking to those who recognize that we have incessantly dismissed the conflict between good and evil as merely a difference of opinion. And we have allowed ourselves to be seduced by those acting on behalf of evil when they tell us that this wonderful and benevolent country of ours was actually founded so that everything could be free to propagate, whether that be good or evil. And if we try to stop it, well, you're just enforcing your morality on me and that's anti-American. And, you know, ignoring for now that the founding fathers would actually disagree with that if you read their actual writings and not just out of context quotes that go viral on Facebook. We have given the heart of our country to evil forces and we are seeing the results of their work every day. And you and I really didn't have a say in it. And that makes us really angry. But you know who it makes even angrier? Him. It makes him angrier. It's the same conflict as always. I mean, good and evil. It's impossible to talk about that conflict without talking about the big man, right? Because we've taken everything that is good and righteous and pure and beautiful and we have mocked it. We have instead elevated everything that is evil and disgusting to the core of our society. Our culture has become an abomination. Abortion, materialism, greed, hedonism, gluttony, lust, convenience, endless entertainment. All of that has distracted us from the most important truth of all, which is that God will not be mocked. And you can roll your eyes. You can keep your pride. Keep recycling to yourself the same tired George Carlin model or, or your favorite excerpt from the Richard Dawkins book, which you only read half of, none of that will matter because you will bow and you will confess just like everyone else. And you will be humbled to learn that a life dedicated to the worship of the self does not make you more than the dust at his feet. And so when you're scratching your head, trying to piece all this together, you're thinking, well, now why would people do this? What's the goal here? It would seem that the belief that God would refuse to end all that is beautiful through his creation if there were good people who may die. And so those who have been corrupted by satanic forces are working to ensure that there are no good people left anymore. So he ends all creation because since Satan is not nearly strong enough to corrupt or destroy God, he has to force God to destroy his own creation by corrupting it entirely, which is us and all that was once good and beautiful. And if you think this sounds crazy, like I used to until a couple of years ago, you should just look outside. You should read more. There is no other explanation. And I refuse to withhold this information because some people might get mad and not stick around for the next time I talk about why socialism equals bad. Because this is the root of our conflict and fundamentally the root of all conflict. And only when you understand that can you begin to make sense of what's really going on in our world. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications and share the video with a friend. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you what, rest of the summer, rest of the summer season, I'm gonna be riding that one out. Share it with a friend, share it with a friend, share it with a friend, clap, 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 share it with a friend, share it with a friend, share it with a friend, snap, snap, snap. That was catchy. That's gonna be stuck in your head. You know what else should be stuck in your head? The, like the, the sentiment of the song, like not only the, the catchiness, but also like the, the purpose. Like what me as the artist wanted you to, to take away from that, which was uh, that you should share the video with a friend. But thank you so much for watching and may God bless America. Poof.